morning and welcome to our worship service at New Light Church in Deland, Florida. We welcome those that are here and certainly those that are watching us online. Our prayer is always that this will be a day not only of worship, but a day of light uh, for each of us in knowing and learning more about God. This is the uh, fourth Sunday of Advent. So we welcome you and also remind you that uh, many have been asking if we're going to have a church service on Christmas Day. Uh, yes, that's the answer. If there are two days that we need to have church in the year, one is Easter and the other is on Christmas. So uh, we will have a service and I will try to make it brief so you can go back home and be with your family. And we will be doing the same thing on Christmas Eve. Well, we will be having a 30 or 45 minute uh, brief service for that time. At what time? It's 6.30. Thank you. Let us continue to praise the Lord with a time of music and praise. As we light our Advent candles this morning, the candle is love. Love. The overused and misunderstood word has been under scrutiny for centuries. Poets and preachers, thinkers and teachers have dissected love in all its original forms. Yet even with so much etymological and linguistic understanding, love is still a difficult concept. Loving well is hard. Receiving love, especially with a past full of hurt, can also be hard. Yet Christ wants to teach us about his love. What is love according to the Bible? In one word, incarnation. When Jesus was born of the Virgin, God took on human flesh for the purpose of dying the final death, to redeem humanity and all of the created order from the grip and consequences of sin, death, and hell. This is love in its truest, highest, and purest form. God loves the people he created so much that he sent his son Jesus to die so that we could live. Today marks the fourth week of Advent, a season recognized by the church around the world as a time to prepare our hearts and lives to welcome the coming of Jesus Christ at Christmas. We track this season by engaging in several rhythms, one of them being to light candles, one for each week leading up to Christmas Day. Today we light the fourth candle, traditionally called the candle of love. With this candle, we symbolize the love of Christ as demonstrated through his incarnation, his birth, life, death, and resurrection. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Christ's mission of redemption is fulfilled through the becoming becoming a baby at Christmas, Romans 5, 1 through 8. In the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the hope of Christ, symbolized by the first candle of Advent, transitions to the love of Christ, symbolized by the second candle we light today. Our hope is no longer an abstract concept, but is actualized and con concretized through Christ. God's love becomes tangible because of Jesus. Receive his love today in your hearts. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the redemption and love we can experience through Jesus. We surrender ourselves to you today and ask that you would do amazing things in our hearts, minds, and lives. We thank you for your love and grace, and we ask that you would teach us how to walk in obedience to you by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's raise our voices in love this morning as we sing our praise medley on the screens and in your bulletin.
Him or him. I'm trying to think of what the number is. Hark the remember. Herald. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 184. 184. <laughs> a word of thanks for all of you that are listening online. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, your prayers for this ministry and also for your offerings. Uh, we need both of those in order to maintain and to keep this ministry going. So thank you. The psalm that I would like to share with you before our time of prayer is Psalms 123. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look into the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Hey, Father, we do thank you for being with us in this season of Advent a time of expectation, a time of knowing that you sent your only begotten Son, offered him as a sacrifice, and through our repentance are able to gain salvation and that wonderful eternal relationship with our Creator. We do find ourselves in contempt, a 
time of refusing God's truth and replacing it with worldly affairs. And for that, we beg your forgiveness. In this world of darkness, we have not seen you with our eyes, but we've been able to see you through the acts of others, through the acts of we who call ourselves Christians. We have not physically touched you, but through the word we have felt your touch. We have witnessed you intervening in our affairs, and for that we th say thank you. We've experienced love. We've accepted your forgiveness. And with joy we look toward heaven. For we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We have called upon you in our battles. We have sensed you in times of loneliness. Times of betrayal. Times of grief. And all our hearts in a time of need. So in this time of expectation, this time of Advent, we thank you for being our Lord, for being our Sovereign, our King, and our salvation. For it is in the name of your Son that we do pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
reading for Advent that Pam and Fawn shared with you stole a lot of my sermon. But that's okay because they say that we learn through redundancy. So there will be some redundancy today. That will be perfectly okay. The two scriptures that I would share with you would be the first one from 1 Corinthians, the letter to those who lived in Corinth, and the 13th chapter, the 13th verse. All of us know that this is the love chapter, and uh, we will be lifting up that 13th verse. And then also another verse that almost all of us learned in early childhood and that is John 3 16 we find ourselves here on the fourth Sunday of Advent celebrating and remembering Jesus and how and when and where given by prophecy how he was to come into this world and certainly all of that was proven true. Coming into this world to teach us, to show us, to experience the Father's love. We have already in the preceding weeks involved ourselves with the subjects and with the truths of hope, of peace, and of joy and has been, have been brought to our attention that many of the words that are used in Christianity have been stolen by the world, taken out of context, and their meaning and their definition changed and even abused. Our English language has taken one of those words love and has thrown it into a bowl of alphabet soup and with that formed different words and different meanings different definitions we've consolidated a lot of words into the four letter word love and then we say well we love fried chicken we love our children we love our spouses we love our friends we love our hobbies that's love if you have ever been to any of my Bible studies you you've learned uh, almost uh, by heart now and by rote the four different kinds of love in the Greek language We've learned that the first type of love is called storge, which is a natural and human love that a mother has for their baby while still in the womb. And then there in the Greek is the word philia, which means a human love that we have for others. Thus, we named even one of our cities Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, even though we may question that in today's world. Then the Greek word eros, words like erotic, physical, sexual love between 
a man and a woman can be enjoyed as a gift or abused by the world for its pleasure. So we look over at the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm becoming a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long in this kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be, there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Do you notice a word that was never used in this entire chapter? Love. The word love. Because we're not talking about love in the way that we would define it, or sadly the way we accept it, in our society. And there's a reason for that because those that have attempted to revise the Bible to make us understand it, supposedly, have taken words and grouped them together that have some of the same meaning. But the end result is we've lost the true meaning. As we've mentioned Christian words have been stolen or misplaced or hid. Our English language has taken one of those words, love, as we've said, and has thrown it into confusion. The agape love, which is charity, and that is the true definition. Replacing charity and the word charity with love waters down and walks away from the biblical definition. And if you begin to read and digest theologically this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians by using the word love, you have lost its intent and its meaning. This agape is not to be confused with emotion or feelings or I love chicken, but loving God as he loves us. Algebra, do you all remember that in school? I thought I was done with it out of high school, but then when I got to college, I learned, well, I've got to take 
now two quarters of algebra. And I think one of the very few things that I remember about algebra was that whatever is on one side of that equal sign has to equal the other side of that equal sign. So I, in my feeble attempt, give you a definition through algebra of God's agape. Love equals is being in relationship and experiencing the rewards of knowing God and then taking that backwards being in relationship and experiencing the reward of knowing God is love. Both sides equal each other. In scriptural language, charity is agape. Loving is just not knowing that God loves us or loving each other, but rather it is us loving God. And when we love the Lord, when we agape the Lord, we obey his com commandments and we worship him as the only sovereign, the only king, and our only savior. This gift of charity. You see, the reason why it's important to keep that word charity is because it's not ours. You see, I can love my wife because that's something that I can do. I can love my fellow man because that's something in my power, in my human abilities to do. But we're going to learn very shortly that I cannot love as God loves. Keep that thought. I cannot love as God loves. This gift of charity is not our personal property. It does not belong to us. Something, it's not something we can lock up in a safe. It's not something that we can use only when we choose to use it. It is loaned to us by God. It's a gift, just like any other gift, for example, mentioned in the previous 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Therefore, it is not ours, but God's, and he loans us, loans it to us for the express purpose to show his love. If we don't use it, we lose it. It is God's charity to manifest himself in and through us. Now, hopefully and prayerfully, you can begin to see the relevance and the importance of the word charity. In the dictionary, when I looked up the word charity, this is what I found, and it could almost be transferred into the scriptures. Dictionary for the word charity. The voluntary giving of help. Aid, giving aid to those in need. Kindness and tolerance in judging others. Is not this exactly what and how God agapes us? He's voluntarily given us help and hope and aid. He's rendered to us when we are in need and he knows how tolerant he's been and continues to be to each of us. And he did this by giving his only son to pay for this gift. This gift was not free. Again, this gift of charity that God loans us is for us to give charity to others. Sadly, when we've taken that word in our language now and changed its definition and meaning, we interpret it as leaving a present underneath the tree. 
or helping someone with food or with money. We don't have the power. Hear this. We don't have the power, and I must confess myself, and many times I don't have the desire to love one another, especially the unlovable. Now, it's easy for me to pick up a baby, to hold that baby in my arms. And there's just a natural outflowing of love for that baby that's in my hands. But those babies grow into teenagers, don't they? <laughs> and sometimes those teenagers are very difficult to love. But then, seriously, there are those who murder, who steal, who will exploit, manipulate, and abuse others. Are we to have charity toward them? The answer is a resounding yes, but, but listen to this again. Understand that what God does through his charity is to love through us. We become a vehicle. God is a copy. He transcends. He comes down. He enters into our spiritual body. And now we become a spokesman, a spokesperson to manifest his love out to others. All we are called to do is to allow God to love through us. This, I hope, can make it a little easier on us to love the unlovable. See, there are some rotten scoundrels out there in the world. And you don't have to leave the land to find them. But we've been called to love them. And then I come back and say, God, I cannot love that sorry person. Well, you just keep trying harder. You just keep praying about it. And eventually, one day, you'll love them. Well, i got news for you. There are some people in my life that I've been praying for over 50 years. And at times, I, I don't like them, I don't alone love them any more than I did 50 years ago. But i tell you what I have learned how to do. I have learned how to love them in spite of myself. And I've learned how to love them by putting myself aside. 13th chapter of this book of 1 Corinthians, it says, in order for God's love agape to prevail we got to put ourselves out of the picture there are two kinds of love here it's God loving through us and us trying to love through our nature and we know how difficult that is you know the old saying God loves you and I'm trying his love his agape is that we repent a word left out of the modern Christian dictionary and I might add from the pulpits and if the word salvation if the word born again offends you then his agape is to change your life to be reborn to become a new creature to grow from being the natural into the supernatural. Is it not our human nature to love someone who murders? No. But it is our spiritual nature to do that. But when God lives in us, it is Him doing the loving. You may identify with this as I attempt to articulate it, verbalize it, put it into words. I uh, desire that this would happen to me more than it does. But there's been times in my life when I have been justified to 
be angry with people. To attempt to secure some kind of vengeance. There have been those nights in my life thinking about those that have done me wrong. And I'm here to tell you that I've come up with some stuff <laughs> that would just literally tear them out of the frame. <coughs> that it would be so vindictive that I doubt that they could ever stand up again. Because the words that I would use would intimidate them, would bring them into place. I've done that. Maybe you haven't. I have. But then, on occasion, something happens. Something happens almost physically in my body. And that hate, and that vindictiveness, and those wonderful ideas of how to get vengeance, justifiably, legitimately, goes away. Now I gotta tell you, it comes back. <laughs> but for a while, I experience God loving through me. For you see, Agape is the fruit of the Spirit. And I, as a Christian, have become a part of the engrafted Word that God has taken my nature and turned it into super nature and has planted me on his vine. So this far we've learned how God loves through us, but let us do a little bit of investigation on how he loves us. Not mushy mushy, kissy kissy, let me hug you, hug me. But I'm talking about charity talking about a God. In John 3, 16, we read, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth a verb in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, some of you may get a little upset with me, but I want to say that there is a condition to experience the rewards of God's agape. I did not say that there is a condition to experience the love of God, the agape of love. What I did say is that there is a condition to experience the rewards of God's love. We'll say, wait a second, God is love and now you're giving me a condition to be the receiver of agape? No. God will always love you until the day you die. He will invite you to have your sins forgiven and will even love you on your way to hell's gate. <coughs> But his love for you is different than the rewards he offers. Separate that. God loved us before our conception. Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And then way up in Luke 12, 7, we see this. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value 
than many sparrows. Now, the word is not birds, as may be in some translations. The word is sparrow. And there's a reason why that word sparrow is put there in the old language, in the original language, and wish we had time to explain it, but we don't. But there's a reason dealing with sacrifice and what's accepted by the temple as a sacrifice. But you put birds in there and then you're talking about ostriches and eagles and that's not what we're talking about. Keep your eye on the sparrow, not upon the buzzards. Jesus said, more value than tree, no. More value than wheat, no. More value than corn, no. He said sparrows. What does this dust to those, what does this do to those who scream, my body, my choice? He will love us forever even if we refuse his love and end up in hell. We are called to love, not condone anti-behavior or beliefs. We are to a copy like God and Christ love us. But we got to put our pride aside. The old black preacher preached, put self on the self shelf and pride on the outside. Not be hypocritical. Have you noticed in reading the entire New Testament that Jesus never scorned or never screamed at the sinners? Think about all the stories in the Bible in the New Testament where Jesus had a confrontation with someone, a good confrontation. A woman at the well, Nicodemus at night, Zacchaeus coming down out of the tree. Never yelled at him, never screamed at him. But man, when it came to the self-righteous Pharisees, he filleted them like a piece of roast beef. Remember the temple? Secondly, one of the ways that God loves us is through discipline. Discipline is just not talking about punishment. Discipline is talking about organization. It's talking about structure. <coughs> Haven't we learned that those whom we end up loving the most are those who have demanded parameters of structure and order? I had a teacher, really a professor, and uh, had asked me, had asked the whole class, to write a paper on a certain subject. Well, I was running behind time, and I figured this is time for my silver tongue to kick in and to uh, translate it to the keyboard on the uh, typewriter, and here I'll bang something out real quick. I did. I looked at it, and I said, looks pretty good to me. I handed it in. Professor called me up the next day after class and said, I read your essay. I said, good, what'd you think? She said, bad. What do you mean bad? Because I know that you banged that thing out in just a few minutes and you didn't even write an outline. You probably just sat down at the typewriter. We used typewriters back then and just wrote something out and thought I would receive it. I thought to myself, oh, you got that right. <coughs> she said, now I'm going to give you a chance, an opportunity to go back. And tonight I want you to sit down and think before you start typing. And I rewrote the essay and turned it in and got a wonderful grade on it. But I want to tell you, to start off with, I was angry. Why was I the only one that she called out of the class and was asked to rewrite something 
because I knew that even that one that I banged out in a few minutes was better than some of the people that had spent hours. But she saw something that she wanted to manifest. And she didn't do it with a kiss or with a hug. But she did it with discipline and by being strict. Not mean, but strict. Tough love. Not codependent, not to facilitate or justify by saying, well, I love my husband or I love my children. In Marathon, Florida, in the Florida Keys, which I was there for over four years, might have been five, can't remember. I was a part of starting a uh, center for abused women, domestic shelter, domestic abuse shelter, and uh, interviewed and dealt with and talked with mostly wives and girlfriends who had finally made the decision that they wanted protection. And the sad thing was they would say that today, but then tomorrow they would go back and change their mind. And there was one common theme, one common thread that ran through all of their excuses and all of their justification for allowing themselves to be abused. And it was, but I love him. I thought that if I heard that one more time, I was going to scream. You know, preacher, it's amazing how many people in the world not trained in any biblical knowledge or theology attempt to teach the preacher and say, you know, preacher, that the Bible says that no matter what, you are to stay with your husband. Oh, I'm interested in that. Will you show me where it says that? I would like to see that because it would certainly help me out in my ministry. To become open and to admit and to, through discipline, not allow others to batter, to abuse. Admitting, repenting. This is the success of Alcoholics Anonymous and many other of those programs. Do you honestly think that in God's agape that he's asking you to allow this abuse? Now, I don't know, and I'm not one of those preachers that can see somebody through the camera. But I suspect with the amount of people that are listening that there may be a woman out there that is going through this type of behavior. And you need to ask for God's guidance and think about continuing to receive it. Do you honestly think that God wants you to go through this? Well, the Bible says I must obey my husband. And they've even quoted scripture to me. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Oh, are you talking about the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians? Well, I don't know where it is, preacher, but I've heard that. Well, let me share with you what comes before that verse and the thoughts that come right after it. Yes, wives do and should submit yourselves to your husbands as your husbands submit themselves to the Lord. Wow. If you are submitting yourself to a husband that submits himself to the Lord, you are a princess. You are a queen. You have been gifted with a life of security and protection, a life of love. Matthew 5.31 says, 
and quotes. It hath been said, whatsoever, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving that is except for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her uh, that is divorced also committeth adultery. Don't have time to explain the whole verse, but let me explain this first part to you. What was happening in that time? What was Jesus really addressing? You notice the word there, putting away? Here's what was happening. You know, in the Jewish custom, when a young girl, young lady became married, her father gave to her a dowry. And that dowry was usually in the form of money, it was in the form of hogs, not hogs in the Jewish, but of beef of uh, maybe fields, some acres. And she would take that into the marriage with her and now it would belong to her and the husband. That's what she brought into the marriage. However, if they became divorced, then the deal was <laughs> that he had to give the dowry back. And not only did he have to give the dowry back, but whatever interest that dowry had gained from the time they were married, he had to give back. So if she brought into the marriage two cows, and now they were married 10 years and he wanted to divorce her, but as she looked out in the field, she said, hey, there's 10 cows out there now. So you're going to divorce me? Fine. I'm taking 10 gallons, not two. So here's a way that some of the men worked around that. They said, I won't divorce her. I'll just put her in the back room. I'll just keep her in the house. We'll stay married legally. But I can bring the young chick in. <coughs> That's what Jesus was talking about when he said putting away. Words. There are other disciplines to be reproved, to be rebuked. Parents allowing their child to attack publics like a stormtrooper and making shopping unbearable for others. Will a father give his son a snake and tell him it's a stick? Will a father give his son a rock and tell him it's bread? Love through action. The love of God is to warn. That's been lost in the pulpit. What has manifest itself in the pulpit today, it would seem, is praise. Warning has left. Christianity is not passive. It's telling the truth even when it's not consensual or not popular. Sometimes that's going to get you into trouble. That's the Apostle John. We have seen how passive, peace-loving, mushy, kissy-kissy Christians justify doing nothing. The first converts of Adolf Hitler. The first converts of Adolf Hitler were the pastors. It's history. It's history. And then the pastors convince their congregations that Nazism and Christianity were one and the same and complemented each other. At the close of World War II, this is history. When Europe was being freed from the Nazis, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, later to become president, rode through the villages where the Jews had been put on railroad cattle cars and traveled right next to many churches. And he inquired of the residents, why did you let that happen? 
didn't you know what was going on? Why didn't you do something? Their response was like the German soldier on laugh -in. Do you remember laugh -in? Do you remember Art, whatever his name was, getting behind the bushes and pushing the palm tree aside and saying, I know nothing. I know nothing. Why is it the Christians, we as Christians are the only group told to leave their views of the world at the door? And usually it's the Christians who enforce this. No stronger words will you hear. For it is not the ugly, secular, impish, devilish, evil world telling us not to give our views on humanity and politics and government and secularism and schools and society. But many times it's our own congregations. Now, preacher, we don't want to hear it when a senator or a congressman or an official or a president does something that through the scriptures is immoral. We don't want you talking about that. All we want to hear from you is Jesus is love. Well, I'll tell you what General Dwight D. Eisenhower did. He said, all you men in this village, you grab a shovel. Because you're going to go out and you're going to dig graves for these Jewish people. And you're going to give them a proper burial. Now, I'm not making this story up. Go read history. During in the beginning of the Russian Revolution, when the country was in turmoil, the pastors and the priests ran, locked the door behind them, and went into a conference. And at the very beginning of the Russian Revolution, you want to know what the priests were doing? History. They were discussing and having a conference on what color vestments they were going to wear for the next season. And their people were being killed. The Cubans joined what they thought was a freedom march. And they found themselves with Castro. The Russians went into communistic ideas and ended up with Putin. And now we sit in our churches with a holier than thou compromising and even condoning evil to our land. Abortion, drugs pouring over the once sovereign borders of our country. Do not believe your lying eyes, we're told. Government telling us what we can do and can't do, different rules for the elite. Finally, it's ridiculous to say with an air of piety and goodness, what we need is the love of God, yes. We need the agape of love. Not the philia, not the eros, not the storge, but the love of God. We have the love of God, but what are we doing with it? We must begin to put feet on our prayers, put gas in our spiritual engines, and allow the winds of the Holy Spirit to move our ships across bias and prejudice, bigotry and abuse. But the biggest news of today is what brings us hope and peace and joy is allowing and inviting Jesus into not only our hearts, but into our actions, our beliefs. Yes, God is love. And what a wonderful event it is when we're able to celebrate the character, the virtue, and the righteousness of a holy God that has come to save us from our sin and invite us into the kingdom of God and later into the kingdom 
of heaven. May the love of God, may the agape of God abound in you. For those of you that were watching our pen just didn't get mad at us and leave he, uh, he had to go to work uh, so we are one of those rare and fortunate churches that has more than one person that can play the piano we do invite you back for Christmas Eve and for our next service and uh, we pray that during this season of holidays holy days that uh, the peace the joy and the uh, hope and most of all the agape of God will be with you. And now as Almighty God sits, sits at the throne of heaven, through the grace of his Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Isn't he